welcome to Blog Talk Radio. I'm the host, Eric Santa Maria, of Wrestling Roundtable Radio, on at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right after NXT. New season should be starting for that, and we're going on right after NXT, at least as long as NXT lasts, which is at least until October. You want to call in, share your thoughts. The number is 347-857-4647. Call in and share your thoughts and questions with the panel, which tonight will include Chris Harris. Hello, Chris. Hello, hello. <laughs> Will Vafita. Hi, Will. Hello to all my wrestling fans of me. And Rodney LeCant. Hey, yo. Yo, yo. What's going on? All right, crew. We're set to talk about the latest goings on in mixed martial arts and professional wrestling. Before we get into that, I want to remind you to support the show by going to WrestlingRoundTable.com, please. Lots of updates, new polls, new recaps, and I want to at least mention Bill Treadway's recaps. I really enjoy them. He's been working overtime, it seems, doing pay-per-views, Raws. And, hey, if you want to add to it, you want to recap some stuff or add a guest column, go right ahead and email WrestlingRoundTable at gmail.com. Get involved. You're a part of the show, too. Also on WrestlingRoundTable.com, the latest news, the store. You can get the T-shirt, support the Wrestling Roundtable, or DVDs of Pro Wrestling Respect. You can also keep up there with our chat room. Don't just stay in the chat room. Give us a call on the number I mentioned. And don't forget, MySpace is not quite dead yet. Everyone's always talking about Facebook is the new thing. MySpace is not quite dead yet for us. Lots of new pictures, the chat room, and the widget for the radio show, all right in one place. So whether you're listening to us on our website, Blog Talk Radio, MySpace, wherever, get involved. And we're going to get involved right now, starting off with Mixed Martial Arts, The latest Strike Force show on Showtime that happened the other weekend in Houston. I mentioned on the show last time a couple weeks ago that it featured two undefeated black wrestlers in mixed martial arts, Bobby Lashley and King Mo, the light heavyweight champion. And now a couple weeks later, they're not undefeated. Both men suffered their first defeat in mixed martial arts on this show in Houston. And going to the opener, it was Bobby Lashley who lost to Chad Griggs. And it started a trend here, and that trend was questioning the officiating of a lot of the referees assigned to this event. And specifically, it was in the second round that Bobby Lashley's cut that he had suffered from an uppercut was starting to come into prominence because this is the part I don't get. He was in mount position pounding away on Griggs, and the referee stood him up to check out the cut. That was the excuse. He wants to check out the cut. Fine. But then, when they started again with, I don't know, probably less than a minute left to the second round, they started standing up. Why didn't they put them back into the position they were when he stopped it? A lot of people questioning what referee John Shorl was doing. Uh, Were you as upset with that as I was, Chris? Just like everything in Strike Force, you have to question why the hell is this happening? Mm-hmm. I, I just don't get. They really can't get a lot right, and this is something that even the fishing, which is out of their control, it can't be done correctly. We saw it at the last show in when Cyborg fought, and that woman took a beating, and they didn't end it. And now this, it was just ridiculous. Well, this was under the jurisdiction oversaw by the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, and people were really questioning what the hell's going on with that afterwards. They don't even do drug testing. But back to this specific fight, obviously, once he was stood up, we could see how winded Bobby Lashley was. And even though he was clearly winning the first round and the second round, I think that uh, he really was just physically exhausted, and obviously, because he went to the hospital afterwards for dehydration, severe dehydration, But at least on points, up until that point when he stopped it, he was winning the fight. And even though he was eating a whole lot of hammer fists at the end, uh, what do you think about that, Rod? Do you think it was uh, the right move to stand him up? Obviously not, especially when someone that's in dominance, not in position. That uh, could have been the fight right there. But if if Lashley was the, I guess, the, the fighter that he, I guess, tries to make himself out to be, he could have put himself back in that position if he wanted to, especially with superior wrestling. But, uh, I mean, I don't know how his training was, how seriously he took it, but he, he didn't have the cardio to go on. Mm-hmm. A lot of people thought that it was he was carrying around too much weight. He looked rather beefy. 
going into this. Uh, I'm almost glad that this happened because I'm sick of this Black Lesnar shit. And now that everyone gets to see why the UFC won't pay him the money that he wanted to coming in, uh, he's not a Brock Lesnar. He was a great wrestler, but, uh, you know, only sometimes I could transition very well to being an MMA superstar. The comparisons aren't going to end there. They Now they have the same record. <laughs> well, when you said great wrestler, did you mean pro or amateur? I'm talking about amateur. Okay, good. Because <laughs> if it was pro, we'd have to dispute that. Oh, uh, um, yeah. But the officiating coming into question didn't end there because right in the next match, which was the welterweight fight between K.J. Nunes and Jorge Gurgel. George Gurgel. George Gurgel, excuse me. All these foreign names, you never know which one's the right way to pronounce it. <laughs> uh, referee Kerry Hatley, what the fuck was he doing there? And I know at the end of the first round, I don't think that was the referee's fault. Uh, K.J. Nunes was throwing an uppercut right in the, the end of the round. The bell was sounding as it was going through, so I'm not going to say he should have uh, deducted a point or anything like that, but it was the same thing in the second round. Now, of course, after that uppercut, you could clearly see that Gurgel was out on his feet. He was done. I'm surprised yeah. that they even let it continue because he was clearly in another world. And sure enough, when the second round started, it didn't take too much longer. But then, now, everyone is saying illegal knee. I'm the only person in the world who thought it was a soccer kick. I think if you pause it, you could see a shin going into his face rather than a knee. But either way, it was an illegal strike. Don't you think that there should have at least been something done with that? I mean, the first round, okay, that there was nothing to do to, to stop that uppercut. But then for it to happen again, don't you think they should have at least done something, Chris? Yeah, it, it's not going to the extreme of Paul Daly where you punch Josh Koscheck after the bell. Oh, it's clear. not going that far. But still, it, it's, it makes the company look bad again. Everything, you know, the officiating, everything looks small time when they, they they just let it go. You know, maybe you call it a no contest or a draw. You punish him somehow. That really was clearly after the bell. Right. Do you agree, Rod? Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it would be different if maybe the referee didn't see it, but it was clear right in his view. It was, like you said, it was a borderline soccer kick, and that's just something that you really don't even see uh, in the U.S., especially in the UFC. So that's not something that normally happens. And, and Moro uh, Gennaro freaked out about it. And, and Chris and I watching it on the couch, we were like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, I mean, at the least, they, they should have deducted a point. Right. Very least. Obviously, KJ Nunes won the fight, but I still think he should have at least been fined, or some action should have been done. And speaking of what happens with KJ Nunes afterwards, that fight made him the number one contender for the welterweight champion Nick Diaz's belt coming up on October 9th at their ex-Showtime show. Now, a lot of people were upset that rather than going for the, quote, money fight with Jason Mayhem Miller, Nick Diaz is facing K.J. Nunes, who I just said something should have been done about after all those illegal strikes in that fight. Now, there may be some discrepancy with the weight classes here, so maybe it would have had to been a catchweight fight, but do you think this is yet another example, Chris, of strike force? not striking on something? Yeah, actually, when we were at Hooters watching USC, the moment that his brother won on in USC 118, I tweeted Dana White immediately to ask him to bring back Mayhem Miller so we can finally get one of these fights we want. I don't get this company at all. I want to like them. It's an alternative to UFC. Ooh, sounds like we lost Chris. All right, well, you want to chime in on that, Rod, then? I, I tend to disagree. I, I think Nick Diaz and KJ News will still be my fight. That was the last guy that beat Nick Diaz. And if you remember, after um, one of KJ News' fights, Nick Diaz was brought in the ring, and there was a uh, you know a whole big scuffle there with the uh, with the Diaz brothers. So I think there's also history here, and um, I like it's it's a way for Nick Diaz to uh, defend the belt. I mean, it's just I guess it shows progression in strike force that. After some person fights, you know their next fight ahead of time. And um, they're not backing out at this one, so I'm uh, I'm all right with the fight. Back on, Chris? Yeah, I'm back. All right, well, then let's just, speaking of yeah. production things, how about all the production <laughs> problems with Strikeforce? Uh, 
usually I'm a fan of their production, but it just seemed like a really off night. Audio fucking problems, cameras looking all fucking weird. Now, I don't want to nitpick, per se, because it really is all about the fights, but that just really didn't help because not only that, the big joke with us is that if you lose, you get a title shot. And I just mentioned the show coming up on October 9th. Well, the 135-pound women's champion Sarah Kaufman is defending the belt then against Marlos Conan, who lost to fucking Cyborg in January. This company does everything backwards. I mean, if they had James Tony, he'd be fighting their champion right now. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's not even to go into the Fedor situation, which is another huge mess. And you can read about that in the news section on WrestlingRoundTable.com. I don't know how much strike force, how much money they have, who's backing them financially, but really it's looking like the end is near if this is the way this company is going to be run. Well, in the main event, light heavyweight champion King Mo who I think a lot of people would agree is marketable, but I don't know. In that last fight with Hagar Musasi when he won the belt, I don't think it was exactly a blow-away performance that we were hoping for because he had had a few of those on uh, some other MMA promotions cards, some pretty good knockouts and quick victories, but he just seemed like he was destroyed. And uh, even though he won that one with his wrestling, not exactly the biggest showy performance, and then he goes and loses to Rafael Cavalcante in his first defense, and he's going to be out with a destroyed left knee. I think he's having surgery for PCL and ACL on that. What would you think of the fight, Chris? It was okay. You know, it, King Mo looks pretty good at for about the first minute or two. Mm-hmm. He looked like he was dominating, he was controlling the fight, but he looked like, just like Bobby Lashley, he got winded pretty early, and that was kind of it. It was over for him. Well, first with King Mo, I have a problem calling him King after six professional fights. But, uh, I mean, look at the competition he was facing before um, he beat Giga Musasi. I mean, it was like Mark Kerr and, like, either guys way past their prime or, you know, guys his level. And that's good that he was excelled for his level. But here I think he was just facing uh, a way more talented striker. And he got caught. He, I think he tried to... Relied on his rush, and he used might have used a lot of energy with those uh, high, you know, high power slams. But I, it, when it came to the striking, he was out of his element. Well, you mentioned the quality of the competition he fought before, and that's what a lot of people were talking about. Bobby Lashley going back to that parallel again, because I believe I don't know this for sure, but I heard the record of everyone that Lashley fought ended up before this fight was eight and fifteen. And he's talking about, I don't want to fight Batista because I want to move on to people with better records. And then He, he wanted a title it. fight, which he would, he'll get now. He lost a fight. Right. So we're, I know we're kind of doom and gloom on Strike Force here, uh, but I think Bobby Lashley losing has made that fight with Batista a lot more likely. And yep. it, it also seems as if that's the fight that Scott Coker, the CEO, wants to be on their first pay-per-view should they go that route. And I don't think you two are too keen on Strike Force doing a pay per view. Could that be the death blow that you're hinting at, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. If you, they go on pay per view, especially without Fedor with it being undefeated, my God, this is going to be a disaster. Affliction was not pulling in huge buys. What were they getting? Maybe a hundred, a hundred fifty thousand if they were lucky, and they were losing money on a hundred and fifty thousand buys. What the hell does Strike Force think they're going to get? With a Fedor, who the mystique is gone, Batista and Lashley, oh, I can't even imagine how awful this is going to be. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Chris. I think they're first of all, they're three. I guess the biggest, I guess the most hopeful stars. I mean, I guess four have failed. I mean, they brought in Dan Henderson. They thought Dan Henderson was going to spike up the ratings. We have this, you know, this legit, pretty much the most legit MMA guy in the roster, and. He loses his first match against Jake. Not only loses, gets dominated. And then Fedor loses. Bobby Lashley loses. And to me, their biggest star has been fought in over the year, and that's Gina Carano. I think you can't well, she's not going to fight either. Exactly. I, I think, you know, um, unless they had Gina Carano on the card, they can't, they shouldn't even do a pay-per-view. Because to me, that, that was their biggest star. That was their, um, their golden goose, you should say. Well, let's not even forget the fact that they let Jake Shields go, and in the wake of that, everyone was saying, oh, we're gonna, they're going to do a middleweight tournament. And then all of a sudden we get to the show, and a lot of people were saying the fight between 
Sakurai and Tim Kennedy was going to be the first of a semifinal little tournament. And nope, it was just, okay, the winner is the middleweight champion. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> no they keep going either. back in the word. They really keep going back in the word and really have to, I mean, I guess you, get, you have to credit them for being as strong as they are, you should say, for as long as they have been. But it, there's just dropping the ball sometimes left and right, and sometimes they pick it back up, but they need to keep it there. The, the way I look at Strike Force is, yeah, I'll watch it for free, because if I'm home on a Saturday night and it's on, or you know, if we decide we're going to get together and watch it, but it, I don't even think I'd go to a bar to watch one of their pay-per-views. It's, this is what we're going to get on their free shows. Yeah, I don't think UFC has ever will ever have to worry about Strike Force stealing their pay-per-view dollars. <laughs> or doing much better on uh, network television than UFC would, huh? Or, no yeah, way. Exactly. They can't. They can't even beat UFC replays. Mm-hmm. They can't beat UFC replays. And, man, and they're on network, crazy. and and UFC is on cable, which is that's pretty ridiculous. I uh, no. So can you imagine UFC on Channel Two? It would be insane. Mm-hmm. The ratings would be through the roof if UFC got on CBS or NBC or something like that. It would be they would do they would kill Strike Force. Imagine a Brock fight on Channel Two. <laughs> Huge! It would be. It'd absolutely. be like Hogan and Andre on a Saturday Night Main Event rating. Exactly. Uh, would be, everyone would be talking about it the next day. People, you'd have so many more new viewers. It'd be ridiculous. Well, a lot of new viewers may have come from this show because one thing that always makes me happy is the amount of fans that call in here on the radio show or leave comments about how we've really turned them on to MMA. And I think a lot of wrestling fans aren't into it at the beginning, maybe because they're intimidated, maybe they don't know much about it, and it's kind of a a starting point that we get them interested in because of our interest and our passion for it, for the real thing, so to speak. What's it like uh, in reality as opposed to uh, the scripted world? But one of the things I wanted to mention was a recent show, WEC 50, and WC's on Versus, this aired on a Wednesday night, and it didn't have a lot of big names and really not a lot of promotion behind it. But that being said, WEC, uh, another branch of the Zufa empire, and I, I don't agree with parallel divisions either, but I do hope that they stay the course and maintain WEC as its own branch, because I think WEC is pretty cool on its own. Their Blu-ray of their first pay-per-view just came out, which was an awesome show earlier this year. But this one, I just tuned into it because, ah, fuck it, it's a night of fights, right? And once again, may not be names that are household uh, recognized names just yet, but man, I love it when you see someone who just makes an immediate impact, and then you remember them. And that's someone I wanted to mention. And by the way, you can get the link to a site, MMA Linker, who you turned me on to, Rod. (laughs) And I spread the word about it because it may be bootlegging, but if you ever need to look up a fight, MMALinker.com. You can get the link in our links section at WrestlingRoundTable.com. It's a great site. use it all the time if I happen to miss a fight. Or, hey, if I go, hey, Rod, you remember Tank Abbott and Don Fry in 94 or some shit like that? Any fight, practically any fight you could ever want to look up at the May Linker. So maybe this one's on there. But I wanted to mention WC50 really quick before moving on to UFC, the big dog that happened on Saturday. But WC50 featured a light heavyweight bout between Anthony Pettis and Shane Roller. And holy shit, did you see this fight, Rod? Yeah, yeah, I know Shane Roller has been um, a pretty high prestige grappler, but, and I, I, I didn't see too much for Andy Pettit before this, but man, what a fight, and what a very unorthodox striker. Some of the shit that he was throwing was making me rewind my DVR. (laughs) Well, it's very showy, and a lot of those flying spin kicks didn't necessarily hit, though they looked impressive, but much like Anderson Silva getting the tap out from a triangle at the last second with just a little bit left to the last round in the third round, he gets a great tap out. And I was just very impressed with Anthony Pettis. And one of my favorite fighters is Ben Henderson, the light heavyweight champion. And they were pretty much setting that up immediately. Like Jim Cornette always loves to say, and the smart marks love it, uh, Zufa is doing pro wrestling better than pro wrestling does. And this is one of those things where they have a hot new star and they set him up against the champion right away. 
and it seems as if they're going to do that fight, Anthony Pettis and Ben Henderson, whom I'm also a big fan of, on December 16th, so can't wait for that. But moving on to what happened this weekend in Boston, UFC 118. I'm seeing a lot of mixed reviews about this card. Now, usually when we get a UFC pay-per-view, what, eight times out of ten you're going away happy, I would think? It's got a pretty good hit ratio because even if it's not the greatest card, it ends up being pretty good most of the time. How many times can you say that on a wrestling pay-per-view, Chris? <laughs> Very rare. Um, well, right at the beginning, Nate Diaz, Nick's brother, fought Marcus Davis in a welterweight bout and won a bloodbath, huh, Rod? Yeah, it seems like Nate, both these guys have been in some bloody fights, and Nate Diaz showed that uh, maybe welterweight is a good for home, good home for him. He uh, he he got the choke. He he used his uh, grand game, and usually for him, he likes to stand up and taunt people. And then we, you know, he waits for the guy to feel comfortable on the ground, or he decides to bring him on the ground. And uh, eight out of ten times, Nate Diaz will get the submission. Mm-hmm. The next fight which was for the number one contendership for the light belt between Kenny Florian and Gray Maynard, went to decision. Gray Maynard won. You seem pretty bored with the fight, Chris. Yeah, it was not a very exciting fight. I kind of agree with Kenny Florian choking that everybody's been talking about. He really, I thought he really should have won that, he, especially in his hometown of Boston. That would be a great moment for him. And I don't, I'm not one to give much props to Boston, but... Um, <laughs> I thought he really did choke, and I really think that the Frankie Eddie Edgar uh, Gray Maynard fight, it, it's not going to be a fight for the mainstream fans. I think it's going to be a hardcore fans only night when that show airs. Kenny Floyd in his big fights like Dana White said seems to just choke. I expected definitely a lot more just because of uh, what, what the winner gets because it's an undefeated fighter from the kind of point I'm talking about, and because it's in Boston. But, and you but you didn't see any strikes. He looked very timid, and he let Gray Maynard control him. I mean, props to Gray for keeping his game plan, you know, against a guy like Florian. But even in the last few seconds, like, Florian just, he didn't even throw, like, a punch in the last three seconds. One of the most hyped fights of the card was Randy Couture's heavyweight bout with James Tony. James Tony showing up. <laughs> Seemingly very overweight, weighing significantly more for his last boxing fight a year ago. And the fight went rather quickly and is pretty much expected. Um, I really don't have much to add to it, so I'm going to throw it to Will Vafides. Hello, Will. It was a heavily promoted boxing versus MMA. That was the whole gimmick behind the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't, want to give, I didn't want to give any doubt. You know, you got to give a guy a chance to see what he can do. You know, just because he's overweight doesn't mean he can't. You know, become an MMA fighter. You know, Roy well, of Nelson course not. I'm one of Roy Nelson's biggest supporters, but yeah, Roy yeah. Nelson's also a jiu-jitsu former IFL champion. So not we we were before. discussing that before the fight. It might have been part of his plan to go in overweight to try and make it work, harder for Couture to take him down. Yeah, exactly. That, that's why I couldn't doubt it. I was like, maybe he might pull a surprise. Obviously, that didn't happen. But the biggest thing to me was, you know, and, and, and this was from the post-fight conference that. You know, Couture's like, I'm not going to walk into a boxer and face him because I know I'll get killed. You mm-hmm. know, and that should have been the mindset of Tony, but obviously he didn't care. And he went against every probably critic that told him not to do it. He did it. And now he'll never be in the UFC or probably MMA again, judging by his little uh, three minutes, minutes of no fame and the fact that he walked out of there all pissed off and didn't even say anything to anybody, you know. That shows you what kind of, what kind of guy he is. He came and admit saying, hey, you know, this is obviously not for me, but, you know. Got, got my ass admitted. kicked. You got his ass kicked. You know, and, it's, and it, it, it feels good, as I guess, as MMA fans to not boxing down yet again. You know, because obviously, you know, boxers just can't get into MMA. It's just unless you have other skills like wrestling, like Brock Lesnar did, he, has, he already has some skills ahead of time, then you really can't really, uh, you know, go into this kind of field. It's just not going to work. Well, that's why it's called mixed martial arts, because it's a combination of many different disciplines. And that's why I never got why boxers, and 
they're probably really just saying it to be protective and macho because their industry is getting destroyed for the most part, except for the one or two huge fights that they do a year, like a Pacquiao or a Mayweather fight. Aside from that, boxing is really out of the mainstream now, and MMA is creeping up and more or less taking their spot. But if they will say shit like, oh, you put uh, MMA fighters against us, they ain't shit, and blah, blah, blah. And I always thought it was ridiculous because... A, boxing is a part of MMA. It's not like it's mutually exclusive. It's part of it. And that's why I think James Tony lived up to, well, not, maybe not lived up to, but it matched everyone's expectations because that's all they had. You have to have more when you go into the cage. And as soon as uh, Couture, who obviously didn't want to stand with uh, Tony and get hit with those cinder blocks and possibly knocked out, shot right in grabbed the heel, took him down, and the moment Tony's ass hit the mat, I said, all right, this fight's over. You th- had the same thought, Chris? Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, we were a little nervous before the bell rang. Cause it, 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 not to sell the guy short, it could take one punch, and that oh, fight could have been over. Mm-hmm. But we saw this back in the very early days of UFC. They would put boxers in there, and they always got beat. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Maybe like a guy like Tank Abbott coming in there and just getting lucky every once in a while. But for the most part, they got beat by wrestling all the time. And it's going to continue to happen. Maybe somebody will come in and do it successfully, but they'd have to actually take this serious, Mm -hmm. not just show up 30 pounds overweight and think, oh, I'm here for a paycheck. What do I care? I was very excited before the fight just because all all this talking, like I guess the the answer in UFC versus boxing, I guess, would finally get a uh, some sort some sort of a fulfilling answer. Well, and well, well don't you think it's also in a way a throwback to the way UFC used to be before mixed martial arts was traditionally born? In the sense that it was discipline versus discipline, and back then it'd be hoist Gracie against a boxer, a straight discipline against a straight discipline. It's almost a throwback to that, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it definitely goes back to that, but it's never been like boxing versus MMA. It's also right. boxing versus. No, that's the new dynamic, dynamic now. Exactly. But once Couture got his ankle, I knew that was it. And he matched him. This was a good feeling with the crowd chanting UFC. And, uh, yeah, he basically just got out of him and said, patting him out. You know, he, he let him, he choked him, got that, you know, great arm triangle, and it was a wrap for Mr. Tony. You think it was the same choke that he taught Brock to beat Carwin with? Hmm? <laughs> well, they've been working on that for a while, so it's right. a good move for wrestlers. Well, moving on to the main event for the lightweight championship, Frankie Edgar from Tom's River, New Jersey, same state as most of us, taking on VJ Penn in a rematch from their Abu Dhabi contest, which huh, I know you want to sound off on this, Rob, but let me set it up. A lot of right. people were saying the real BJ Penn was going to show up this time. BJ Penn's pissed off now. He didn't look the same as he usually does in that last fight. He's going to come back hungry. And, in fact, I think he was still the Vegas favorite going into this fight. And the whole marketing behind it was Frankie Edgar's going to prove whether it was a fluke or not. And that was a big question going in. And I don't think there's any questions coming out, is there, Rodney? BJ Penn had no answer. First off, I... When people say the real BJ Penn, like, who is the real BJ Penn? To me, he showed up in Abu Dhabi. At UFC 112, he was there. You know, it wasn't like he was he missed weight. It wasn't that, like, you know, he was sick or had any injuries. Even pre-fights, in the pre-fight interviews, he said that, hey, I'm not taking this guy lightly. I know he's a tough kid. And straight up, he got beat on his feet. I mean, to me, I think when people think about the real BJ Penn, they think about, you know, the, the five seconds where he was knocking out Sean Shirk or him choking out Kenny Florian. Uh, I mean, if you watch the Diego fight, it, he pretty much had the same pace. You know, he's not so much of an aggressor. He doesn't, like, take down guys at will like uh, GSP or really outstrike guys uh, in a significant way like Anderson Silva. He could be a very subtle counterfighter, and that's what BJ Penn is. And in the first fight, he just was a little bit surprised about how quick Frank Yeager moves and, you know, all this stuff happens, oh, it's too close, blah, 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 even though BJ Penn got taken on twice. And then this fight, I think BJ Penn did nothing to adjust. I mean, besides the one takedown, or the two, I should say, Frank Edgar had him beat on the feet, and he finally killed Seal for, um, in the lightweight division. 
uh, Frank Yeager has his number. Frank Yeager, I think, proved all the critics wrong and proved that he wasn't a fluke. Do you agree, Will? Yeah, I mean, it was almost, I almost thought it was identical to the same first fight. It was like exactly the same. You know, yet, but the one big difference was I think there was a little more action in this one. Yeah, I think Edgar was more aggressive in this one. Yeah, he definitely, uh, he definitely, uh, definitely was. And he got some big takedowns, and, you know, and Edgar was even caught in a spot where he was able to get out of. And, you know, like Penn, I, I just don't see Penn doing anything significant anymore. I think there's too many upcoming young guys in the, in the division, and I just don't see it happen. I think Edgar's the guy right now. And, yeah, I know the next fight probably won't be, like, a headline, like, Meet event kind of fight. They're probably gonna have to throw something in there to make it a little more star worthy. You know, Edgar is doing everything he can, and he's proving himself. But I guess people don't see a market in him. I guess they don't see something unique about him, which is why I think the media is killing him. And if you guys watch the post fight conference, he's still getting trashed while he's there. It's like, you know, what does this guy got to do? To get some credit. So you think the Edgar Maynard fight doesn't have an aura around it just yet? I, I don't think there's gonna be. I, I think they're going to put something in front of them, which would suck, but, you know, but... I mean, Don't be I mean, shocked if it's the GSP Koscheck fight, if that's the same show. Then again, you know, two title fights is all, it would be more, is even more impactful than one title fight, so why not? I mean, that that's a win for us. Well, you know, they did do that in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think, it's much that I like to watch Frankie fight, and it was great because... I won money from him winning because I knew he was going to whoop BJ's ass. I uh, don't think that him and Gray Maynard, maybe it's just him and another name that could help draw more people, but Gray Maynard isn't really a, a headliner just yet, and I think their two names alone are going to want people to buy the pay-per-view, and they're, uh, I, I think they're going to you know, need a strong co-main event, if not another title fight. I think it's kind of funny that about this time last year, Everyone was writing about the unbeatable set of UFC champions. Lesnar, Silva, Penn, GSP, Machida, across the board. And the question that BJ was asked after the fight is where he goes from here. Is he going to go back up to welterweight? What's he going to do? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to go back and think about it. Oh, BJ got dominated twice in a row. I don't think he should stick around in the division. I think he should move up to welterweight. Mm-hmm. Maybe get some. You know, he's really besides Frankie Edgar, he really dominated a lot of those guys for a couple of years now. Move on, move up. He he really. There's nothing else for him to do in there. I don't know. I think that the GSP fight proved that he does not belong at welterweight. So, I mean, guys like Thiago Alves, John John Fish, those are big guys who walk around at like 200 pounds. And BJ really hasn't looked in greatest shape when he's at 170. I mean, I think Maybe lightweight. WEC. I think lightweight is where he's at, and you know, when you just have a guy who has your number, that you know, there still could be other challenges at lightweight. Just you know, just because he's not the champ doesn't mean he can't stay in that division. And we're going to move on to pro wrestling in a little bit, but I want to do some other things first, which includes taking a call. Amato, hello. Uh, I was also one. People who expected BJ10 to the real BJ10 to show up and was very disappointed. I even saw the fight for free and I was just like, man, this is just horrible. Uh, well, what made you think that um, the real BJ10 was there and wasn't there at UFC 112? What was the difference between this BJ10 and the last one? In the first round, I saw him doing. Uh, he was getting them a lot with that left hand, the left jab to um, to the face of Edgar. But I didn't really see him try to do a lot of takedowns until like the fourth and fifth round. And even after each round, he uh, his corner was really just telling them they were just trying to get him motivated. Edgar's you know corner was just you know giving him like, hey do this, hey do that, you know watch the takedown, don't let him take it down, you know move around. And when you know it was just it was really weird to hear BJ's corner tell him, you know not giving him advice. They're just getting his head. All right, right, but I will say it's not like. The GSP Sarah match where Sarah caught GSP with a punch and then GSP came and you kind of knew that that was a fluke. It wasn't Sarah out striking being quicker than St. Pierre for five rounds. Frankie did that in Abu Dhabi. He stood up with him toe to toe. It wasn't um you know it wasn't like the Nogueira Frank Mirror fight where Nogueira was getting trounced around. BJ looked in shape. Obviously he lasted all five rounds. And I think at the end, he pretty much, he looked fatigued 
while Frankie Edgar had his hands up. And I don't think he really learned from that fight. And uh, when, when he's training with Phil Nurse, who has experience with GSP beating BJ Penn, I mean, I don't see why people think that Frank would get submitted when he has it in his career. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. He he just, the, the, third, the fourth and fifth round, he had his hands, uh, he had his hands up, but he just, uh, you know, Edgar was, you know, bouncing around, and he was still moving. He was moving around, and it, he just looked like he was running circles around BJ, and it just didn't really look entertaining. I kind of got up for a few seconds because I was really mad. I was, well, as soon as I saw BJ take him down to the mat, I was like, all right, well, maybe he's going to pull a Silva. And, and yeah, that's what we that were saying round. throughout the fight. Is BJ Penn going to be able to pull off the Anderson Silva? When I saw him going for that, that arm bar, I was like, oh, man, you know, when he had, a, when he had him locked, he was getting ready to go for the arm. I was like, oh, man, there it is. And he, you know, Edgar got out of it. And I was like, wow. With a guy like BJ, I mean, people question now they're like, oh, he's not motivated, blah, blah, blah. I just think that he just didn't have a right team around him. I mean, if you listen to what his quarterman was saying, come on, you know, go get this cocksucker, blah, blah, blah. You have two rounds left to win this. And meanwhile... Hey, Rodney, watch the language. This is PG, motherfucker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a PG show, sir. And- and then, you know, I hear Frankie's corner, you know, giving him more pointers than anything. Uh, I just think, you know, BJ could use a different support system. Let me put it this way to you, Rod. At the end of this fight, before I even had it, uh, the judges' score ringing in my ears, I had it scored 50-45. That's exactly the same score they gave it. Edgar was energetic at the beginning of every round on BJ Penn. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember Penn winning a single round the last time in Abu Dhabi either. So if this guy's lost 10 rounds in a row to Frankie Edgar, I think that's pretty fucking definitive, don't you think? 50 minutes straight, he beat him. And what are you going to say to that? I say we're going to bring on Ryan from Massachusetts. Hello, Ryan. Hey, guys. What's up? Been a while. Yeah, good to have you back on. What's on your mind? Well, first off, Eric, I just want to say, to be fair, it's more like Edgar beat Penn, uh, more like eight rounds in a row, because the first, like, couple rounds of the one at 112 could have gone either way. Okay, fair enough. But, I mean, this time around, there was really no question. I don't know if uh, Edgar really, really stepped up the training, or BJ just said, fuck it, I'm just going to go in like before, but... uh, I mean, like you, everyone's already said, there's really no more adding that. It was pretty much very definitive this time around. As far as the Couture-Tony fight goes, I want to go back on that for a sec. Okay. I mean, Couture's gone on record for saying, even if um, that if he were to go into a boxing ring with uh, Tony, he probably would have gotten knocked out. Um, I mean, because there's really no way to advertise UFC versus boxing because it's either one element or another. There's some overlap, but that's it. Right. One can be incorporated into the other, but not the other way, it seems. Right. Even I mean, Lesnar has plenty of frame for coming in with... I mean, you, you can't... You, you straight up cannot just come into MMA with one uh, discipline. It can't be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Logan, submission night. I mean, I'm from Massachusetts, obviously, so I was really loving that fight he had. That submission, everybody that I was watching it with was on our feet, cheering, so screaming. It was just fantastic to watch. I really want to see where this kid goes from here. All right. Well, thank you, Ryan. And from here, we're going to move on to wrestling, like I said. And I wanted to bring up some polls first because I forgot to bring up the poll last time. Last time we did our radio show, we talked about TNA's Hardcore Justice pay-per-view. And we had a poll on that on our website. And here's what you said. Now, usually on these polls, and there is a new one right now on WrestlingRoundTable.com, I give you a lot of different options all across the board from positive to negative, and I just try and gauge what you might say. And I'm surprised, our usual cynical bunch, that the option of it was fucking awful and just TNA's latest uncreative retread got 0% of the votes. Hmm. How about that? TNA's hardcore justice pay-per-view and the whole ECW retread thing in general. The results went. 11% went to it was really cool and I'm happy to see the ECW guys again, which was tied for another 11% to it needed Paul Heyman. 32% said it was great for one night and 46% said it was okay. So, nothing too overwhelming there, but one of our other polls was about the U.S. champion The Miz. 
with the Money in the Bank briefcase and your thoughts on that. Results were 4% said that he'll get hurt or something unforeseen will fuck it up. 8% said they know what they're doing and it has plenty of legs. 12% said he'll win and do squats on Benoit's grave. And I should correct that. It was Santino Morella who had to do squats. It should have been throw his bags on Benoit's grave. 14% said they will finally pull the trigger on the next big heel superstar. The pipe of people. 24% said they're testing the waters, but not certain yet. And the overwhelming majority, 38%, said they'll fuck it up or hesitate like always. A lot of confidence in the youth movement in WWE right there. I wanted to bring up something because it was uh, something that just occurred to me. You know how everyone says, and I mean, he says it in interviews himself that he plays a superhero, that he's Super Cena. Cena is Superman, and he always makes the Superman comeback and blah, blah, blah. Well, what's the parallel to Superman? Isn't it Batman? So who's the Batman of WWE? Ah, Randy Orton, right? That's perfect. It's seen as seen Superman and Randy Orton's Batman. He's got the egg. He's the anti-hero. And, oh, yeah, and he goes on rants. Remember last year when he got <clears throat> Anderson slash Kennedy fired for fucking up that back suplex on Raw? Well, there was a secret recording afterwards in the back. It sounds similar to Batman. I think the parallel's pretty good. Kick your fucking ass! I want you off the fucking set, you prick! Now, don't just be sorry. Think for one fucking second. What the fuck are you doing? Are you professional or not? Yes, I am. Fuck's sake, man, you're amateur. Seriously, man, you and me, we're fucking done professionally. We all know what happened to Kennedy after that. So if Cena's Superman, Orton is Batman. So anyway, back on to pro wrestling. Last night was the 900th Raw, and I refuse to fucking call it episode, okay? Episode it should not be used in the term of a wrestling show because it sounds ridiculous. Wrestling is supposed to pretend to be a sport. You don't say, hey, did you catch that episode of baseball last night? Maybe it's just me being old school, but I just hate that. So 900th show, edition, whatever you want to call it a Raw, I refuse to call it episode. And besides, they keep calling it it's the longest-running episodic television show and then go on to list all the shows that lasted longer than it, like The Simpsons. Hello? But anyway, what would you think of the show, Will? Well, it wasn't nothing really spectacular, really, about it. Uh, I mean, the CM Punk promo was probably one of the best parts. And the fact that they're built, they uh, they did a lot of things to set up the pay-per-view, which was good, too. Uh, they made Wade Barrett look really good as far as being a big guy. He took out The Undertaker, and he beat Randy Orton, so that was pretty good for him. So it built him up, and Jericho is teasing, is teasing his departure. Right. WWE, so that's a big thing too, and that's a big game to lose, especially around this time. But uh, like I said, they teased Bret Hart and Undertaker. We knew that match wasn't going to happen. You know, How did you know it, that? It was okay. Raw, nothing stood out to me except for the Sam Punk promo, which was probably a really good promo. I wouldn't be surprised if someone like him gets a uh, you know a lot more freedom to say what he wants because he know he's pretty good at it. So I think it's just like kind of like the men. I think he gets his own little, like you know, open forum a little more than uh, most people do. So that, that's how I feel about it. And when I feel about the Superman Batman thing, wouldn't that be a good idea for a WrestleMania main event to to, uh, to to unify the titles if that's the plan they're going to do? Oh uh, well, we'll get to the unification stuff a little later. Um, Want to bring on another caller? Four one six. Hello. Sorry, I got nervous. Uh, my name's Will. I'm from Toronto. All right, Will from Toronto. What do you have to say? Sorry, Will. I don't know if you guys just saw the NXT episode. Cabal Loki got a rep at winning um, season two, and now with Brian Danielson being sort of like the big guy at SummerSlam, and now with Tyler Black getting signed. Uh, I just wanted to kind of ask you guys, um, do you think WWE and Ring of Honor are sort of going to have more of a professional relationship moving forward um, in terms of scouting sort of new superstars and having sort of a, I don't think they'll, they'll ever buy out Ring of Honor, but just the, those two companies working together. And do you think it would be good, it's good for Ring of Honor because sort of it gets their name out there or it'll be just something bad because they'll just take all their top talent? 
Well, it's more of the latter, isn't it? There's never going to be a relationship like that with Ring of Honor and WWE. Ring of Honor's function in WWE world is to function as an unofficial developmental. They have FCW in Florida, but they're fully aware of Ring of Honor. And, in fact, when Ring of Honor got on HDNet, they were sending their writers, check out HDNet, there's another wrestling show on Monday night. We have to look at them. And I guess they've had their eye on Tyler Black for a while, and when his contract is up, they go right after him. So, in that sense, they really don't need to work with Ring of Honor if they even had the inclination, because Ring of Honor just makes all these guys, and they can just take them once they get to a certain level. It's what they did with Punk and Gibson as soon as he was ready to come back, and all these guys. So, there's really not going to be anything official there. Um in terms of, like, uh, uh, making Ring of Honor a developmental or anything. Uh, they just take what they need whenever they want it. So that's Ring of Honor's function to WWE. I agree with you on that. You know, Ring of Honor is a, is a whole separate, you know, thing. I don't – WWE would never – I mean, they're not going to invest in another wrestling company. I can tell you that now. They're probably they're, – they're too big and they're too strong, you know, and so – it only probably to Vince McMahon it would look weak if he would actually do something like that to go down to another smaller company. I mean, after all, he's got two companies under his belt. He's got you know you know he's got WWE and FCW, and you know there's no you no know, he's just going to steal talent because guess what they got the money to pay the talent and they're going to steal everybody. That's just the way it is. It's a very different situation, this wrestling landscape in 2010, than it is when he was doing that. Because everyone makes the parallel with Ring of Honor and ECW, and fine enough if you want to do that. But it's a very different wrestling landscape than it was back then, so it's not going to be quite like that. 254, you're on with Wrestling Roundtable. Hello. Hey, this is Yankee Fan for life, and I'm calling from uh, Oklahoma. I just saw the uh, NXT tonight, and they were showcasing the the Divas for next season, and I was just wondering, do you think that the WWE would have a uh, all Diva n- Nexus kind of thing after next season? Uh, I don't know if they'd go that far. I remember back in 99 that do you remember, Will, before SmackDown started up as a series every week, a weekly series, rather, in the fall, that they had that special sometime around April, maybe, after WrestleMania of SmackDown? Yeah, I do. I remember hearing at the time that the initial idea for SmackDown was to make it an all-diva show. And you've heard similar things about, like, the other year with TNA, how they kept trying to get new shows on Spike TV because of the success. And by the way, the beautiful people reunion, at least of the originals with Angelina Love and uh, Velvet Sky was the highest rated segment on The Last Impact. Should tell you something. Yep. Because of the ratings that they were getting, they were considering making an all-women's group. And of course, that was when Scott Demore was running the division and everyone liked it a lot more. And of course, since then, they've stopped caring and fired most of those girls. Um, but for an all-women Nexus style group, I don't see it happening because just the way women are portrayed in wrestling, unless you get an amazing Kong and an Isis the Amazon, who I saw you talking about in the chat room, Will, uh, unless you get a group of women like that, uh, women are just going to be portrayed as these weaklings who are promoted as being strong but yet get knocked out with one clothesline. I don't know about that because women of their size, if they're real fighters and athletes, look more like Cyborg, and I think she could kick the ass of most of the women, uh, men on the WWE roster. So that's just the way they portray women, and I don't see that happening. Do you? I don't see a chance of uh, them doing that, you know. I mean, what they can do now for the first time ever, instead of doing a freaking diva search, they can actually have some real freaking talent, which is nice to see. They got... You know, so now they're going to finally have real women who can actually wrestle, and now we might be able to get some Divas division going a little bit more now, maybe get some more wrestlers into it. Maybe WWE starting to get away from the, the good-looking ones and starting to get some wrestlers. And most of the women that have been announced are not really that, you know, Diva-ish, you know, so which is good. Mm-hmm. So, but to me, I think that they're going to start getting away from the old, Diva sexuality and get some real freaking women in there and wrestle. I think that's going to happen. So 
I think this is a good thing. Well, it would be, but history hasn't shown they've truly gone all the way with that. But now that you mentioned the, the belts in the women's division, yeah. uh, the upcoming match with Molina and Layla, I suppose, at the Night of Champions pay-per-view is going to be a unification match. And that has sparked a lot of debate and talk on our message board, which you can sign up for at WrestlingRoundTable.com. But while you're there, if you're going to shop for anything on Amazon, please do it through our Amazon store. And keep up with the show on iTunes, which you can do if you're on iTunes. Go to the iTunes store, search Wrestling Roundtable. You'll know it when you see it, not just because of the logo. It'll be the only thing worth listening to. Or you can go to WrestlingRoundTablePodcast.com. But plugging out of the way, uh, the message board on WrestlingRoundTable.com had a thread today about all these supposed unifications that are going to be happening, allegedly culminating with a champion versus champion, big gold belt and the spinning belt being reunified, I guess, at WrestleMania 27 coming up. And that's actually what the new poll on WrestlingRoundTable.com entails. What do you think about supposedly all these belts being unified and of course the, there's going to be one women's belt now the tag titles have already been unified and the u.s and intercontinental title might be unified as well what do you think about this rod uh i mean i think it'd be great it would, it would definitely take us back to the days where at least the belt meant something when there was one heavyweight champion uh one set of tag champions one intercontinental champion and you know with all these guys who fight for any of these belts that like, but now there's like there's so many champions you can't even keep track and really it, ever since you know each set of shows had their own champions it really diminished of you know being a world champion because it really I, I guess it just lacks uniqueness and if they're going back to this I really just hope they do it the right way. See that's I mean I personally enjoyed where one champion was on both shows. Right when they did the the brand split the first time in 2002 the women and world champion would go on both shows. And it actually led to some pretty cool and unique situations, like The Undertaker when he was doing the heel biker gimmick after he beat Hogan for the belt in that terrible match at Judgment Day 02. He would feud with one person on Raw, like Jeff Hardy, and then he'd feud with someone else on SmackDown. And then he'd go back to Raw and feud with Tommy Dreamer. And it led to a lot of interesting things, so maybe the move to sci-fi with SmackDown coming up in the fall, I could see a situation where they're like, well, we really need to attract viewers to sci-fi because we lost a shitload of viewers with the fake ECW and then didn't really recover with NXT. So to really get people to tune into SmackDown, we're going to have to put a lot of the Raw stars over there. And you see those people on Raw all the time with the specials like last night. So maybe it could be the beginning of the end for the brand split because I always said for all these years – the big payoff for the brand split is going to be when they do the big brand versus brand show, and maybe if they do this champion versus champion match at WrestleMania, that could be a version of it. What are your thoughts on possibly going back to the way the belts were handled in 2002, Will? That's the right thing to do. I would like to at least keep the United States title around. I don't think getting rid of that one would be good. But, you know, I agree with it. Two world championships, is, it's just not. It's just too silly. And and I and I've been hating it ever since they brought it back. And I think that if WrestleMania, if they have a unification match, uh, that would be the culmination and would start. I think they would see the end of the brand split. It might might just end. I mean, but it, or at least it brings a uniqueness to it. So I definitely am I'm for that. I think United. I think the Divas Championship was like the cross in the line for me. I was like, Are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? I was like a Divas title. I was like, for what? What did that do? You know, I... I, uh. I love the play on words. It doesn't even make sense. One's a champion of women, and the other is the champion of divas. What the fuck does that even yeah, mean? It doesn't make any sense, but I, I think this is a good thing. It's a good idea. I like to do Raw Tag Team titles, and they look very good, very refreshed. And I think we'll have a new WWE Championship belt, because I need a new one. I can't stand that spinning one. Mm-hmm. You know, because, you know, they, they didn't walk around with the smoking skull belt as the world title, you know. It's John Cena's WWE Championship belt, ladies and gentlemen. That's what it is. So get a new damn belt, and let's start, like, going forward and get rid of the old shit. And, you know, they might even do a new logo, too, so this might all culminate into this. Well, that's true. That could tie together. But putting it that way, all right, the thing with the two world titles, 
and actually to a lesser degree all the other stupid belts. Um, the thing with the two world titles is WWE has always used it as a chance to have their cake and eat it too, and by that I mean having two world champions at once. That way they can pretend there's two big guys on each show. Now, the thing about that is, is like what Rod said, however, it's all in how you do it. And even if you did unify the championship again and you had one champion, well, the big problem is that all these belts don't mean anything. Last time we had a, the roundtable discussion here on Blog Talk Radio, I was talking about how I don't believe this youth movement until they fucking do something full bore with it. And Lawrence said Sheamus is the champion. Well, yes, Sheamus is the champion, but Cena's still the top star. He's still the biggest draw they have. He's still on the cover of everything. And Sheamus didn't even win it any convincingly way the, the first two times regardless. So it's all in how you do it. That being said, a lot of people who are against this idea will say, well... If there's one champion, that's even less opportunities for all these people. And there's such a big roster, that's why they needed a brand split in the first place. Do you think that if they made one champion across the board, Will, that that would mean less stars being made? Or are they at a critical juncture where they have no choice and they have to make new stars, like you mentioned Jericho leaving? Let, let me ask everybody out there, and I'll, I'll even ask you this. What is the point of putting a belt on somebody? Well, the point would be, for instance, I can't believe Cena's not the champion. The guy's selling more, more merchandise than anybody. He's still the top star. That should be the champion in my eyes. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you put the belt on someone to get them over, which sounds ridiculous because they should be re over in the first place. Well, the point is, Seamus is, is the WWE champion to me because you need to get him over, and this is the only way to do it. You need to have a dominant heel be a champion. It's only well, that's not the only way to do it. I don't think so. I, I, I got to disagree. No, it's a convincing way. Yeah, it's a convincing way. So, to me, I think the fact of putting a belt on somebody is to make them look big. John Cena does not need to have a championship. Hulk Hogan did not need to have a belt. The Rock, Stone Cold, did not need to have a belt to get over. They were able to do it. Once they got their championship and they got over, they didn't need a belt anymore. And I don't think he needs a belt anymore either. He can get over anyway. So he doesn't need to have a belt. It's better for him to chase them for the belt and not win it because there's more value in that. So Sheamus being champion right now is fine until they find somebody. And it's going to be the same thing for the Miz. They're giving him a Money in the Bank briefcase to make him look like a main event star because eventually he's going to cash that in in the main event, you know, area, and he's going to get and he's going to get the belt. So, or maybe lose it, wherever, however it goes. So it makes it more valuable now to only have three belts that the guys can go for, and you know, if you're the champion now, you are. There's only there's only three other people who have belts with you, and that's a big deal. And that was big back in WWE days. Uh, you know, as WWF, and now it's going to be even bigger now if they only have the four belts. And I think it's going to work out, you know, and we have to give it a chance. Yeah, it is, big, it is a big deal. Uh, it wasn't back, a big deal back then, but I don't know now if it's going to have that same impact. I don't know if they're going to be able to clean up what they've done since they've had two belts and all of a sudden make champions that legit. And it also goes about delivery, how they do it. And uh, to go to Sheamus real quick, being the champion, I really don't think it does anything for him. It's also how you get the belt, too. And he didn't even have a, a clean win over Orton. Maybe if he dominated Orton and pinned him at SummerSlam to really legitimize himself as a champion, that's what a real heel champion is supposed to be. I mean, when, when Brock beat uh, The Rock for the belt, I mean, you really didn't know who was going to beat this guy. And that's what really uh, helps make it the baby face, too. Who's going to be the baby face, too? to finally, like, beat the, the dominant heel champion that people are going to pay to see lose. And uh, with, with Sheamus, I don't get that. I mean, I think it's – the common, I think, thought is that he's not going to have the belt for long, and I see him as a transitional champion. Well, well a transitional to champion – back from changing diapers. Now, a transitional champion is only to have the belt for, like, a month. That's That's a transitional champion to me. I don't see that. He's had the belt for long enough, and he keeps winning in these ways that are, you know, so that piss people off so much that they make him hate him more because he's never really winning a match, you know, without having some kind of controversy in the win. So that makes him even more of a heel. 
and why more people uh, I don't know. I, tr- to me, transitional champion is getting the belt from one guy people care about to another guy people care about to actually have those two play each other. So I think, um, you know, as much as I like Jericho, unfortunately, when he when he won the undisputed title back in uh, 01, he was transitional champion, you know, from, from Stone Cold and the Rock to Triple H. And, uh, I mean, he, he was a drawing, so... And to me, those are the transitional champions, people you know who are saving it for a champion that people actually want to pay to see. All right. Well, let's bring Corey from Chicago in. Hello, Corey. Hello, Eric. What do you think about all this title unification stuff? I think it's about time, especially with the women's title. It makes no sense to have two women's belts when there are eight but four people who can wrestle for them on the roster. Well, let's remember, Corey, that they brought back the women's title in 98 when there were two women, Jacqueline and Sable. So it it, it could get worse. Okay, that is true. History has proven it can get a lot worse. I saw the lineup for NXT3. It's going to get worse. Yeah, but you wrote that big column for WrestlingRoundTable.com about how much NXT was going to suck, and it got Brian Danielson more famous and over than he ever was in his career. So how about that? Yes, he was quite famous before he got clubbed in his soft head. All right, I'll give you that one. I think that by reducing the number of titles, too, we might actually, at least for the sake of storyline, give some of these wrestlers something to fight for. We're back at that spot that we were right before the WCW Alliance angle ended, where almost everybody has a belt and none of the belts have any meaning. If we cut the belt number down at least by two, we can give some of the fans something to look forward to. Nicholas. From Indiana, you're on with Wrestling yeah. Roundtable. Yeah, I agree with the um, tag team titles being unified and the Divas title and Women's title because both uh, divisions, there's nothing much in the Divas and tag team. But I, I, um, I disagree of unifying the uh, Intercontinental title and U.S. title because you're going to have a huge, huge mid-card uh, wrestler thing. And if it's just one belt, it's going to leave some people out and probably be jobblers for uh, some of these re- uh, some wrestlers. And also, I toss, I'm changed my mind on the world title and WWE title. I agreed to unify it because we have so less of uh, contenders for both WWE title and world titles. Well, let's not forget also that last night King didn't even come out with his belt beat the shit out of the tag champions, and made them look silly, too. But that being said, uh, as far as belts meaning something, I think if they didn't unify the Intercontinental U.S. title and kept them separate, that wouldn't be too bad, because, like you said, they do have a considerable mid-card. But, again, it's all in how you do things. And let's not forget also, and this is something WWE seems to have forgotten for the most part, outside of fucking comedy, there are ways to have people feud and have meaningful matches without belts involved. It just takes a little creativity. I know that they're kind of starved for that when they're booking shit week to week, but there used to be ways to do it. Ryan from Massachusetts, let's bring you back on. What do you think about this whole situation? Well, uh, I just want to go back to one uh, something that was said about Sheamus. First off, that he's constantly winning matches via unlegit ways so people hate him more. more. Mm-hmm. That works for Edge. That works for Jericho. It shouldn't have to work for Sheamus. He should. In other be, words, all the smaller guys than Sheamus. Yeah, because Sheamus look has the look and should be a monster heel like he was in ECW. As far as him being a two-time WWE champion, the sad fact is these days with how the world title goes around, unless you have five or more world title reigns, you're still a nobody. It's sad, but that's pretty much the way that WWE treats these guys nowadays. You have to have at least five world title reigns to be considered a top guy. Ugh. I will take year-long Cena title reigns over five any day. Um, One of the things I also wanted to bring up was uh, someone who just had their first match air on Friday, and she was already fired. That would be Serena. Serena fired from WWE, supposedly supposedly because she wasn't living the gimmick in public, wasn't being straight edge, partying too much at bars and drinking. 
And once again, to bring up our message board, this started a really interesting conversation. Went in a lot of different directions, and I don't even know where to start. Um, for one, do you guys think that it's ethical in 2010 for a publicly traded company to be firing someone because they didn't live their cartoon gimmick in public, Will? So that's a tough call because, I mean, there, there's got to be more to it, but... Oh, I, I think there definitely it, is. I don't particularly well, buy that. Well, I don't but. Know, I don't know. Well, I don't, well, first off, we don't know what she really did to even, you know, do that. That's like if wrestlers don't wear suits to work. You know, because I know Vince McMahon has, like, a strict policy with, uh, you know, you have to wear, like, nice gear when you arrive to the building. You know, because they're also going to fine you if you don't do that. It's kind of, I guess it's kind of the same thing. I don't know. But that's like if the All-American Hulk Hogan got caught hitting a woman, you know, at some point. You know, while he was in the big... Well, that's, that's, that's a little off. But let's say it was uh, smoking cigars and drinking beer like he did in his Hollywood days. Like, back in 1985, when he was saying, train, say your prayers, eat your vitamins to little kids, if there were pictures all over National Enquirer, let's say, of Hogan, you know, doing all that sort of stuff, I guess that'd be a little more comparable. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it stinks for her because, you know, she even shaved her head for this. You know, that really stinks, you know. And, uh, well, between the nose job, pit job, and shaving her head, she did a lot to get on TV. Well, you know, and, you know, we'll, we'll probably find out what happened, you know, after her 90-day policy ends or whatever happens. But, you know, I mean, that stinks, you know. And, you know, but then again, she really didn't serve much of a purpose, honestly, you know, for CM Punk's stable. She know, was a woman so. with a shaved head. What more do you need? That's all, that's all, that's all she was. That's the problem. It doesn't really <laughs> well, Rodney, so what do you think about this? Do you think that um, some someone should be fired by a company – that I've said before, self-hating wrestling people. This is, if it's true, a very old-school carny thing to do, isn't it? For a company that promotes themselves as portraying characters on episodic TV, why would they be so upset that someone's not portraying that character 24-7? Yeah, well, because, they're, again, they're a publicly traded company. They have to try to live their gimmick as much as they can, you know, to, without going too far. But, but they kept again, trying you know, to get emanate, uh, nominated for Emmys because they're a show with characters and stuff. People don't play their yeah. characters all the time in any other industry. They just found a reason to knock her off. Now, whatever she did, I don't know what that is. It didn't seem like she did anything wrong. She just had her first wrestling match, so what could she have done? You know, that she must have done something pretty bad or something that she did. Like maybe she did some random act of violence in public. I don't know, but, you know, we'll see what happens the next couple of weeks. I think you're mixing her up with Tiffany. Rodney, you still there? <laughs> I'm still here. All right. Let's hear what you think. I, I think with, with the Divas, there's always some sort of shady reason why uh, these girls get fired. I mean, I, I mean I've never been to, um, you know, backstage at WWE, so I can tell you what really goes on back there. I know these people are really like but I think the whole firing is pretty silly because ever since the we don't want to insult our intelligence speech by Vince McMahon, and you know, they the next segment, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're basically saying these guys don't want their like on TV, they're real people, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, if she's at a bar, everyone over there is over 21 and knows wrestling and it is what it is. I understand what the risk is. What's it doing on the TV? She was supposed to videos on her in MySpace or whatever of her, you know, drinking, you know. Uh, that I, I could see them at least, you know, saying, at least giving her a warning. But, I mean, Christ, I mean, she fucking shaved the heads of the company. At least could do is give her a warning. Well, maybe she didn't shave everything. Ron. <laughs> uh, what's going on, fellas? Hey, Ron, what's up? Man, uh, well, all thing I want to know is when the concrete floor is going to get his rematch with John Cena. You know, but anyway, um, that's just kind of kind of bullshit to me because you know what I'm saying wasn't Taker in a relative state, and he still ended up getting married and photos all the other bullshit came out. But you know, it's people. You know, she she's expendable. They, they could find numerous other bras to, to shave their head, I guess. But uh, but I kind of came too late, man, because I'll, I'll do some shit. But uh, I just want to know uh, when the hell did Cody Rhodes got a fucking mirror on the back of his jacket? Doesn't this also bring up a question of the independent contractor versus employer situation, too? Because a lot of the 
details are in there in the lawsuit with that Raven and uh, Mike Sanders and Canyon filed the other year, but WWE seems to keep wrestlers under employee circumstances where they tell them every single thing that they have to do and dictate in their lives almost outside of just their characters. That could possibly also come up. But one thing I wanted to bring up to another angle was I want to bring you in on this, Corey. Yes. Don't you think that it's possible that this happened just because she's a woman too? Because Mickey James not too long ago was getting trashed in Europe and that probably had a lot to do with her getting released too. Absolutely. I remember when I was four, my mom pitched a conniption fit. This was like a week before WrestleMania. We were at the grocery store, and there was an issue of National Enquirer, and it said, Hulk Hogan, porno scandal. My mom pitched a fit, yet Hulk Hogan was still main eventing WrestleMania that year. Yet here we have Serena, so low on the totem pole, she messes up allegedly once or twice, and suddenly, oh, she's gone. Now, when I first heard that, I couldn't decide, did you fire her specifically because her sto- of her storyline with Punk? Because if so, you messed up there, too. Before she shaved her head, and then again right after the shaving, they mentioned on television, they had Matt Stryker do this. They said that she was a recovering alcoholic, she kept falling off the wagon, and they had explained that that's why Punk always screamed at her. So you can't even say you fired her because she broke her storyline, because that was her storyline. I think they were afraid of her because she was one of five people who happened to be female who could actually wrestle and not just stand there and scream. 917, you're on with Wrestling Roundtable. Name and location, please. Uh, Hi, this is uh, Dominic from Staten Island. Hello, Dominic. What do you have to say? Well, um, can we go back to the world title unification thing for a minute? Sure. There was a time that I really liked that Raw and SmackDown had the separate titles because um, this is back, you know, WrestleMania 19, WrestleMania 20, when the shows really had, you know, like separate feels to them. And you guys have talked about this on the show that Raw, you know, with Bischoff as the general manager and Evolution, that was sort of like your Attitude Era type show. And and SmackDown was your wrestling show with Angle and Lesnar, Mm -hmm. your pure wrestling show. And since that's when they first started having their own pay-per-views. So there was a brief time between WrestleMania 19 20 that they really did feel like different shows. But now that there's like three different drafts a year and the titles can be drafted too, that the Intercontinental title is SmackDown belt and the World title was a Raw belt and it was SmackDown, now it's Raw, then it was SmackDown again. I don't even know who is a Raw guy and a SmackDown guy anymore, so... Yeah, I think it's kind of time for this era, the Raw versus SmackDown era, to kind of come to an end. And so I'm all for unifying the belts. And my whole hope is that the new championship belt looks like, you know, the Winged Eagle belt mm-hmm. from the early 90s. Well, Punk and Straight Edge Society and Big Show were on Raw last night doing their, continuing their feud. Would it really make any difference if they were on every week? I, I guess. I think it makes it more special with... Uh, CM Punk, you know, CM Punk deserves to be on both shows because he is so good and he is, like, getting over, like, crazy in the crowd. So, to me, someone like that who has the ability to get over like that should be on every show. And even Big Show is a funny guy, too, when he wants to be. So, I think overall, if you want to put him on both shows, there's nothing wrong with that. It's going to hurt a lot of the younger talent, though, because a lot of them are going to have a hard time getting over now if they do... Because the whole point of the brand split was to build new stars, which they did, and they did a very good job at. If you put I'll dispute there, that, but that's another show. Yeah, well, yeah, I can't dispute that, because how can you dispute that? A lot of these guys would have never got chances to be wrestlers if we didn't do if they didn't do that. So a lot of guys were improved. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how you could see it wasn't a good thing. It was a bad thing, I think. Because they got along for decades without a brand split, and no one even thought to have one, and... Even in light of the brand split, how many stars did they really make in those first couple of years? Two, three? Brock Lesnar was one. I could probably say it was the first one. Mm-hmm. But he yeah, would have been a star uh, anyway, regardless of the brand split. But, I mean, again, that's a whole other topic, so we'll, we'll save that for another show. But continue your point. Oh, that's it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, before we go, I wanted to bring up the – Huge amount of deaths that have happened in wrestling the past couple of weeks. 
hell, just the past weekend there were four. And the week before that, week and a half or so, there were four. So there's been about eight wrestler deaths, national and international. And I guess the two most prominent to us would be Lance Cade and Luna Vachon. Uh Lance Cade has a whole history of drug problems, and WWE tried sending him to rehab, paid for it, and they have their program to send to other former employees to rehab, which Scott Hall is in right now. seems like the clicks use that a lot. Um, the Luna Vachon DMZ reports that they found a lot of crushed Oxycontin and snorting straws in her mom's trailer that she was living in. Uh, do you have any thoughts on all these deaths that are happening right now, Will? And I guess maybe how it relates to Linda McMahon, since that's been a lot of on a lot of people's minds too. Yeah, I mean, first off, I want you know it's very upsetting that you know that you know. You know, he passed away. It was, uh, you know, it's never good to see that. You know, one of my favorite moments from him was actually when he first started, when he, when Austin came out and did the boring thing with Lance Storm and he faced Garrus. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. That was one of his first, like, real shots. Everybody look it up. He had history of problems. You can't really blame WWE for it because he's had these problems a while. You know, he tried, they offered him to go to rehab. You know, so to them... For them to bash Linda McMahon on the death is kind of like not really fair because she didn't, you know, they tried to help the kid out, you know. They he, did, he but she him. does open herself up by saying stupid shit like she didn't even know him. Well, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, like she didn't even know him. Okay, well, that was like a dumb comment to say, but like I said, you can't fully blame a company for his problems that he's had for years. So, you know. That's the one thing I don't like is that they kind of said, you know, it's, it's WWE's fault. You know, it's not really WWE's fault. They did everything they could to prevent. You know, at least in my eyes. And as far as Luna goes, you know, it's a shame, too, because there's a, that's, that's a, one of the most important women in history as far as wrestling goes. She was, like, so unique and so different and so evil. It was just, love, you know, always good to see her because she was always, like, a, you know, one to watch, you know. She didn't Definitely. get to wrestle a lot. She didn't get to wrestle a lot in WWE, which was a shame. But you know, uh, you know, I think that she should have wrestled a little bit more. But she had some funny moments with like Bam Bam Bigelow. I thought that was always nice to see them together. They were always a good team. It's a shame to see that. It's never good because you, you never, you never wish death on any of these people. You know, they work their ass off, and you know, when they're when they're done wrestling, it just seems they like run into a, you know, a state where. They think they're, you know, they try to revive their careers. They can't do it. They turn to alcohol. They turn to drugs. And it's a, it's a real shame. It does suck because Luna was real cool, real old school, real into wrestling, uh, coming from the Vachon family, of course, with a unique look, unique character. And she wasn't a bad wrestler either. I was always upset that of all these championship runs that they gave to all these people like Deborah and Sable, because she did come back around that time with uh, Goldust also. And then the oddities that she never got to win the women's championship. I always thought that sucked. Uh, what do you think about these rash of deaths, Rod? In wrestling, how can I get surprised? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's I mean, it's a sucky thing to say, but yeah, I mean, with, with Luna, she was definitely uh, she's around for the while. She's probably one of the um, the female wrestlers that I've probably seen the most. I mean, who else can say they? Treated with Wonder Blaze, Sensational Sherry, and uh, Sable. Uh, I think she helped, I, I guess. Especially with Sable, she really helped get her over to make her the superstar that uh, she was of the Attitude Era. Definitely, definitely. And did you have the same thought I did that, wow, she teamed with Bigel at WrestleMania 10 and they're both dead? Wow. I Now, wow, no. The thing that now, her, I guess her and Sherry too, huh? Yeah, I can see both sides of the Lance Cade thing in a way, though, because the fact is that they did pay for rehab for him. They did try and get him help, and of course, it's all uh, up to the individual at the end of the day. But doesn't WWE really open themselves up? Like I said, with the stupid comments that she would make to the public, I think she needs a better PR person. But don't they also have to answer for? perpetuating the environment that people think they have to do that to get bigger, to get the stardom, to get the money, to get the push. Because let's take a look at uh, just a 
side by side, if it was possible, of all the WCW cruiserweights from WCW and let's say like '97 and how huge they fucking got when they got to WWE. Like, see, he who we do not speak of, Guerrero, Kidman, Mysterio, all of them. Yeah, as, well, I think I think Benoit was. Yeah, he might have gotten a little bigger, but I think at the end of his WCW career run, he's that's where he started to get huge. If you see him in like '96 and see him in like. 99 in WCW. It's like two different guys. But yeah, I think I think once you're in WWE, you have that, that pressure that, um, you know, you need to be big in order to be marketable, in order to make money for yourself and make the fans respond to you because, you know, if, if you look at all the guys they favor really quickly, it's all huge guys like Cena, Batista, uh, Triple H until he got big. You know, he wasn't uh, in the top... Uh, top roster, top tier of the roster, and Brock Lesnar, you know, these guys are huge, and when you're when you're small, I mean, they really just look over you and feel like there's no place for you. And, and Cade wasn't even a small guy, per se. Yeah, but, you know, he, he didn't exactly have a big piece to physique either, which, uh, I mean, I feel like it, it shouldn't be needed, but, you know, it's I don't run the show, and unfortunately... It, it is with the, with the way it is, you know. No matter what they say, they, it's all about the image. Well, that's going to do it for this week of Wrestling Roundtable Radio, and we'll be back in a couple weeks, same time, same place. BlogTalkRadio.com/slash Wrestling Roundtable. Join us in New York on September the 11th, Ring of Honor's Gory by Honor Nine. If you can, we're going to be hopefully shooting a blog there and hopefully getting some good interviews and things like that. So join the crew there if you can. It is sold out. Maybe you can scratch up a couple tickets. And if you have tickets already, we'll see you there. And join us on WrestlingRoundTable.com. Get the links to our MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, Go Fight Live, and join the message board. Sign up for the newsletter. Jason Aletto seems to have gotten his computer back up and running, so we're sending out more of those. So for the panel of Will Vafitas, Chris Harris, Rodney LeCon, and all the callers, thank you. I'm Eric Santa Maria. Join us next time in a couple weeks. See you on WrestlingRoundtable.com.